please let me introduce Ryan Tao from Murders Lab. We're going to dive into ZKML now. So yeah, up to you. Thanks, Ryan. Alrighty, thank you so much. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan. I'm the CTO of Modules Labs, and I'm here to talk to you all today about um, our foray into GKR, uh, which is a prover system specifically tailored for zero knowledge machine learning proving. Okay, let's get started. So before I get started, I just want to say that uh, we here at Modulus have been working very, very hard on the problem of ZKML since last year. And basically today's talk is to kind of share with y'all some of the wisdom that we've gained from basically implementing complete projects in ZKML and where we think we kind of need to go next. And so that's why I'm here to bring you the Modulus perspective. So this is also the roadmap for the talk. And if you ever get lost, don't worry, this roadmap will, will, this roadmap will come back and you know exactly where we are. So first off, uh, we believe that basically there should be specialized provers for what we call specialized computation regimes. So you can think of an EVM as one type of computational regime. You can think of general smart contracts as another type, or in our case, machine learning. Now, it turns out that, yeah, as I was saying, machine learning, we think, is a specialized uh, regime. And it's actually very, very different from the other computational regimes, which is why we need a specialized prover, such as GKR, to do basically proving for ZKML. And finally, once we've discussed GKR and why it's so cool and why it's so fast, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's next in store, um, which is, hint, hint, remainder. It's our implementation. Um, but again, we'll leave that for then. All right. OK, so let's get started with specialized provers for specialized regimes. And so for each of these sections, there's going to be one key takeaway. So for example, in this first section, all provers are specialized. And we'll see why this is the case. So if you think about basically the kind of land of proving systems and like all the systems that are out there, you can actually kind of start to categorize them by what they were designed for slash what they're really good at, right? So for example, if you care about constraint or uh, circuit flexibility and like ease of design and things like that, then you might want to go with something like Ultraplunk or CIRCOM, uh, which allows you to define lots and lots of constraints however you want. On the other hand, if you care about proving the program trace of an, uh, basically a VM execution specifically, then you might want to consider AIR or Starks because in there, you basically have this specialized like two time step constraint that says that this time step should come from exactly the previous one plus whatever uh, assembly instruction you're doing. Alternatively, if you care a lot about proof recursion, then you might want to look into Fry plus Plunky 2 um, since uh, this uses basically all native field arithmetic and there's, uh, I guess, nothing yeah, everything is just very fast about it, small fields. Um, also, if you care about VDFs or IVC, um, naturally folding and uh, basically in the form of Nova or other folding schemes is like literally tailor-made for this. And finally, if you care about machine learning inference due to the structured nature of machine learning algorithms, as well as the data parallel nature of how we process such uh, basically inputs to those models, you might want to consider GKR. Now, you might be asking yourself, why? Why would I consider GKR? GKR is crazy. No one's ever used this before. So a little throwback. Um, uh, basically, at the beginning of this year, we actually wrote this paper uh, called The Cost of Intelligence, uh, which went ahead and took actually a lot of the proof systems that you see on the screen right now, including GKR, and ran a bunch of neural nets through them. And so for a little taste of our results, here you can see basically on the x-axis, the number of parameters in the model that we tested. And on the y-axis, you see how long it took to generate the proof. So this is just one kind of metric that we cared about. But the point is that if you look at this orange starred line right here, this is the line for basically GKR. And so clearly, it performs very, very quickly. It scales very well. And actually, it does even better than what we're showing here, because the implementation here was a single-threaded implementation, uh, whereas everything else on this graph had like 64 cores or whatever the machine had. Um, so it's very, very, very fast. So even before knowing what machine learning is or before knowing what GKR is, you can already see from the numbers, it's pretty good. Okay. So now let's dive a little bit into machine learning and why computation in machine learning doesn't quite look like computation elsewhere. So the key takeaway here is that machine learning algorithms are both what we call structured and also what we call data parallel. Um, so before we actually talk about that, um, I'm just going to give a quick primer on machine learning. So for folks who are vaguely in the know or aren't in the know, uh, basically machine learning just says, OK, I have this model. Uh, it is just a model of, I guess, something that I want to predict. The inputs to this model are, for example, a cat image or a dog image. And what this model is going to predict is basically whether it thinks this image is a cat or a dog. And so there's basically two phases in machine learning. There's the training phase in which 
uh, you basically take your big uh, training set of a ton of examples, you feed it through this model, and the model learns the correct parameters to make the predictions. Um, afterwards, you basically fix the parameters, and you fix the model architecture, and then you throw real world data at it. And you say, hey, here's this random image that I found off Google. Tell me what it is. And the model says, oh, I think that's a cat, or oh, I think that's a dog. And so it's precisely this process, this basically computation during test time with real world data that ZKML tries to prove. It is proof of machine learning inference. So that's basically what all these words say. You don't have to read them. OK, great. Now that you know what machine learning is, um, we can talk about basically the structure of it. So consider the structure of a typical kind of neural network. So this is what we call a feed forward neural network. Most of you have probably seen this before. Um, a couple key things to note is that one, you can already see there's like layers in this, right? So here's the input layer. Here's where all the inputs are coming in. Some transformation happens to them. And then here's the next layer. And then some other transformation. Here's the next layer, so on and so forth, right? So machine learning has this already very layered structure. And on top of that, for each layer, so for example, let's consider a linear layer in which you basically have a matrix vector multiplication. So in this case, the input to this layer is basically x here. Uh, the weights are w. Actually, I have colors for this. OK. So the weights or the parameters to this layer are the w, which is the matrix. Uh, the actual inputs to this layer are the x. And then the outputs are the y. And so if you think about the actual operation, which is happening in the matrix vector multiplication, you'll notice that basically in order to compute this first output y, we need the first row of w's dotted against all the x's, right? And in order to compute the second uh, output y2, you need the second row of w's and so on and so forth. And so there's this very kind of natural structure here where basically the location of the output, or kind of like the index of the output, if you will, depends directly on the index of the input which is coming in. Right? You can literally see it in the colors. Y1 always comes from the first row of W. OK. So that's for basically a linear layer. Uh, there's another type of layer called basically a bias layer. It's even simpler. You basically have x, which is, again, the input to this layer, b, which is some just shift that you're going to shift all the inputs by, and then y, which is the output of that shift. And so again, if we look at the individual operation, we'll see that all the y's come from exactly the first row of b's and x's, so on and so forth. So this whole mapping from output index or like location to input location is exactly what this structure is all about. So keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, the other part is that machine learning is what we call data parallel. In other words, normally, again, let's say you have this cat dog classifier, then I can feed an image of this cute Pomeranian through it, and I can get out the label dog. But why should we stop there? We have GPUs. These GPUs have thousands of cores in them. We can run tons of examples through them. Right, so I can run all these at the same time. And so what that should scream at you in ZK circuit land is basically I'm running the same circuit, right, the same model, the same architecture, through many, 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 many different inputs. Um, and so this is what we consider kind of the data parallel setting. Um, and it turns out that GKR just supports this natively. So that's pretty cool. Um, so as a quick recap, um, first, machine learning models are very, very structured. They run in data parallel settings. Both of these things tend not to be true for other compute regimes. And also, they are huge. And I mean huge, right? There are th these things have billions of parameters, like gigaflops to teraflops for the compute. It's very, very difficult to circuitize these things and actually prove that they executed correctly. We need something different. We need something better. And that's where GKR comes in. So for the GKR section, there's quite a bit to cover. Um, this will get a little bit into the weeds. You'll see some equations. If you don't understand them, it's fine. I'm tr I tried to break them down. I'm very happy to answer questions uh, uh, basically afterwards. Um, but yeah, just uh, you got it. All right. So the point of this section is that GKR is cool, that GKR is very, very fast, and also that it proves machine uh, learning circuits pretty easily. And we'll see what that means. OK. So first, let's talk about why it's cool. As a real quick background on GKR, uh, it was actually developed in 2008 as kind of a complexity theory result, um, and it was later refined into something that's been practical basically throughout the years. Um, GKR itself is what we call an interactive public coin protocol. In other words, there are basically rounds of GKR that happen, and it operates over these things called layered arithmetic circuits. So similarly to how you saw the feed forward uh, neural network had layers, the GKR circuits also have effectively layers that uh, line up adjacently to each other. Cool. 
And then the final thing is that at a very, very high level, the way that GKR works is that it iteratively applies the sum check protocol, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, basically to reduce what we call prover claims from one layer to the next. In other words, imagine that you are the verifier and I'm the prover, and I'm saying to you, hey, the output of this circuit that we've agreed upon is this value, right? So that is a claim. I'm claiming to you that the final layer in this circuit uh, basically evaluated at these points equals this value. And so you say, well, I don't believe you. Why should I believe you? And I say, great, let's play the sum check game. So we do sum check, and then we reduce that claim to a claim on the previous layer. And then you say, well, I still don't believe you because I don't know what that layer is supposed to be. And I say, great, let's play the sum check game again. So we do this uh, basically over and over again until we get to the input layer of the circuit, at which point either you already know the input to the circuit because it's public, or I've given you a polynomial commitment to the input, and I produce an opening proof for that polynomial commitment. So this is kind of the high-level picture of how GKR works. So just keep that in mind as we go on. Okay. So that's kind of, I guess, like the uh, background. And why don't we actually just look at a concrete example of a GKR circuit. So in this GKR circuit, uh, we basically have, again, this input layer here, which consists of what I'm going to call x, which are kind of like you can imagine, again, the model inputs, uh, w, which are kind of the model parameters, and b, which are the model biases. And the operation that this circuit computes is w hat -mard product x, which is just this element-wise, basically, product between the x's and the w's, plus b. So we're just going to add all the B values onto here. Okay, so that is what this circuit does. And if we introduce a little bit more sort of GKR style notation, it turns out that if you look at these layers as basically columns of values, like arrays, if you will, uh, you can actually just represent these using multilinear polynomials. Um, so a multilinear polynomial is just a multivariate polynomial that happens to be linear in each variable. And the nice thing about these particular multilinears, so v2 tilde, v1 tilde, and v0 tilde, is that when you plug in basically the appropriate binary values into their parameter set, it turns out that they actually just spit out exactly the values from this layer for you. In other words, evaluating the polynomial v2 at 0, 0, 0 should give me this first element right here. And then evaluating this polynomial v1 at 1 should give me this element right here. So to make things concrete, uh, this is the thing that we just talked about, v2 at 0, 0, 0 equals the first element, oh my gosh, the first element of x right here. And then similarly, uh, v2 at 1, 0, 1 should give you this one right here, which is just b1. Okay, so that's kind of the quote unquote data representation in the circuit. Um, if we think about actual kind of relationships within the circuit, on the other hand, let's take v1 of 0, for instance. So that's this one, and the way that we actually compute this one is by taking v2 of 0, 0, 0 and multiplying it by v2 of 0, 1, 0. So this turns out to be kind of the circuit-wise relationship for v1 of 0, and you'll notice that here we have basically this binary multiplication gate. Um, similarly, uh, v0 of 1, uh, which is this one, comes from basically the addition of two other values, um, in particular this one and this one. And so you'll see that the lines connect, which means we have an add gate there. Okay, all right. So this is basically the GKR circuit sort of setup. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about something that I'm calling the canonical GKR relationship. So this is a basically equality that maps between any particular multilinear extension or the data in any particular layer and that of its the data in the previous layer. Uh, so there's a lot of math coming up ahead, but we, we'll break this down. Okay, so if we look at the left-hand side, vi tilde of z basically says in the ith layer, what is the value at index z, right? So uh, uh, also I used a bit of shorthand here, z, x, and y are all binary strings. Um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. But the point is that vi tilde of z, for example, could be v2 of 1, 0, 1, right? Like that, it could literally just be like this value here. And so the question is, for any particular value in the current layer, indexed at z, what is that expressed in terms of the values in the previous layer? And so you can do this, as it turns out, by basically taking a big summation, so this is a summation over x and y, which just represents all pairs of gates in the previous layer. So you're basically saying, okay, for every pair, just, just, just give that to me in like an iterator almost. And then you're saying, okay, now we have this basically wiring predicate add i plus one at z, x, y. So what this says is, is there an add gate at basically x and y, which yields the current value of vi at z, 
right? And so it'll be a one if that's the case and a zero otherwise. And so if there is, well clearly the right thing to do is to basically contribute those values from the previous layer in an additive fashion. So that's exactly what this part does. And then similarly with the multiplication gates, um, so again, is there a multiplication gate here, right? Like, are there the two lines that are connecting in a multiplicative way to receive basically the current value that you're getting? And so if the answer is yes, then we contribute those previous two values multiplicatively. So in essence, uh, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, we have VI, and on the right-hand side, we only have VI plus one, and so the relationship between a previous layer and a next layer is effectively established. Cool, okay. So at this point, um, we now have, I guess, like how a circuit looks, and we also have how to relate, basically, layers in a circuit to each other. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess as a very concrete example here, um, you'll notice that instead of this particular relationship, the V1 of zero equals V2 of zero, 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 times V2 of zero, one, zero, we can replace it actually with a multiplication gate, which kind of says the same thing which is that we're starting from zero here, and then zero, zero, zero from the previous layer, and then zero, one, zero from the previous layer should give you a one. So that's effectively what these wiring predicates are doing. Um, however, okay, so now that we kind of have like the relationship established, the question is how do we actually prove this relationship, or how do we actually do this claim back propagation stuff that I was talking about? And the answer is through sum check. Um, so the version of sum check that I'm going to get, or that I'm going to give, is not very complete, but hopefully the abstraction makes sense, and hopefully you should be able to go from there. But the TLDR is that um, in sum check, uh, a prover is able to basically prove to some verifier that a particular sum over all binary strings of length k over a multivariate function that takes those as input is some value, right? And you can see why this is valuable for us, because in our canonical GKR relationship, that's exactly what we have here. And so we would like to reduce this summation check into something that's much easier for the verifier. And that's what sum check allows us to do. So in sum check, basically the way it works is that you start with this big summation, and then the prover and verifier play this one round game where the verifier says, ah, here's a random challenge. Please bind the first index, basically, in the original function to that random challenge. And also, we're only going to sum over everything else, right? So we're not going to sum over b1 anymore. We're only going to sum over b2 through bk. And so it turns out that if you keep on playing this game and you bind more and more things basically to random challenges, then at the very end, the only thing that the verifier needs to check is what we call this oracle query. In other words, the original function within the summation, f, evaluated at all of the random challenge points. But there is no summation anymore, right? So this is effectively what we're going to use to basically do the claim reduction thing. Okay. So again, I have up here the actual like relationship expression. And so if we think about what happens after the entire sum check process, the Oracle query, in other words, the F of R1 through RK that was on the previous slide, basically gets boiled down to this. So what's happening here is there's no more summation and the X's all got bound to random challenges U and the Y's all got bound to random challenges V. So the verifier just needs to evaluate this particular expression and it's good to go. So we're so close, we're almost there, okay. So the question is, of course, how does the verifier actually check this Oracle query, right? Like, how does it know what the value this is supposed to be? Well, let's break it down. So first we have these wiring predicates, and the nice part is because the verifier already knows the circuit ahead of time, right, as it should, um, it can just evaluate this on its own. So it's totally good there. On the other hand, um, for these values, vi plus one at u, vi plus one at v, so on and so forth, these values are proven recursively via sum check, right? Because these are actually values which are supposed to come from the next layer of the circuit, the vi plus one, whereas currently we're looking at vi. So, that, so basically we can take these values and say, well, I still don't trust these values, but I'm gonna use them as is, and then I'm gonna force you, the prover, to prove to me that these values are also correct, also via sum check. And so you can see how this process basically repeats over and over again until, again, we get to the input layer and then we can do something else there. Okay, so to recap, um, the prover claims basically that the output of the circuit V0 equals Y. Um, the verifier reduces this claim to the next layer um, by basically playing the sum check game with the prover. This happens so on and so forth until the verifier is left with the claim on the input and then you can just verify this by either a PCS opening or by directly evaluating the input yourself. <laughs> cool. Okay, uh, okay, so GKR is very, very cool. It's also very fast. Um, so GKR is speed. Also, I am speed, because I don't have that much time left. Okay, 
Uh, okay, so uh, one cool thing is some check works purely over field elements. There is no group operations happening, there's no pairing, and it's also extremely parallelizable on the prover end, so it's very, very fast. Um, also, uh, as opposed to, for example, in Planckish circuits, where you need to perform polynomial commitments to every single column in your Planck table, GKR only needs to polynomial commit on the circuit's input layer. So all those intermediate layers, you're good, because you can use some check. Um, also, there exist kind of these separate time-optimal sum check protocols. Happy to talk about that later uh, or offline. Um, and actually, it turns out that parallel proving for such, oper uh, for such operations is actually sometimes faster than sequential pro uh, uh, computing. So pretty fast. Okay. Uh, finally, GKR proves uh, machine learning circuits easily. And so we can see this by basically the structure of the machine learning circuit that we just looked at. So in other words, um, yeah, there's a lot of text here. It doesn't matter too much. But if we look at basically the, stru uh, the structured GKR circuit, that, or the GKR circuit that we had previously, it turns out that we can write it in a structured way. In other words, if we look at the relationship between basically V0 and V1, well, it turns out that V0 at zero comes from V1 at zero, right? And V0 at one also comes from V1 at one. So instead of writing zero and one, let's just plug in V1 directly here. And then same thing for V1 here. And so the point is that basically it's the same bits, it's the same indices which happen on both sides of the equation. And that is the structure here. Um, and so it turns out that if you basically have this type of relationship, you don't need the wiring predicates anymore. And the verifier actually has a really, 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 really nice time basically doing the claim reduction. So doing that sum track process. Okay. Um, and I guess the slide of hand that I pulled on you was that, oh, this was actually a machine learning circuit. And so machine learning circuits are structured, so you can do the structured thing, so everything is fast, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Okay, all right. So what's next? And the answer is, well, it's remainder. So uh, we have at Modulus have been working very, very hard on implementing uh, such a GKR proving system specifically for basically ZKML. Um, so it'll be a robust implementation. Uh, also, it has built-in data parallelism for when you want to batch over your AI computation. Um, the open source version uh, will be coming out by year's end, so it'll be an early kind of New Year's gift for everyone. And also, uh, we are supporting data parallel and also large-scale, basically, decision-forced inferences, which we will showcase in November, so stay tuned for this. Um, if you're not convinced, you should listen to our expert testimonials. Uh, Riyad Wabi says, hmm. Justin Thaler says, and if you're still not convinced, or you want to feel these emotions for yourself, feel free to join us on Twitter or join our Telegram group, in which we will post lots of nice, nice GKR and ZKML related content. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Raya. You got me worried for that screen, but I love the passion of the <laughs> presentation. Uh, we have time for questions, so yeah, please raise your hand. Thank you for the talk. My question is about non-linearities basically in the network. You just mentioned like metric multiplication, but like it's much deeper or like skip connection, self attention and non-linearity. So I'm interested like how this work, yeah. Yeah, so skip connection, so residual connections and things like that are actually very straightforward. You can just wire things like wh however you want to. Um, in terms of non-linearities, uh, yeah, so uh, currently I think binary decomposition of things tends to be the best way to go. Um, however, given not look up lasso um, and uh, hopefully other multilinear lookup arguments coming in the future. Um, those should be much easier to deal with once those can be basically integrated. And we've, I think, fairly good reason to believe that you can integrate lookups actually into GKR. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I'm not too familiar with GKR, but doesn't it require a fan in two where each uh, gate has only two inputs? Uh, is there like a way around that to do more complex models or? Uh, is that why did decision trees? Ah, okay. So I guess the first part of the question: Does GKR always need fan in two? Not necessarily. So in the kind of canonic GKR, um, I guess equation, uh, it does have fan in two, right? Like there's explicitly two values that are being contributed. Um, you can easily imagine though, just adding another variable here and saying ah z u v w or whatever, and having v i plus one u plus v i plus one b plus v i plus one w. Uh, actually, there's a way to generalize this to uh, actually unbounded fan in, at least for add gates uh, or for addition gates. Um, I think for a higher degree, uh, you might want to consider the trade-offs of like, ah, oh, I have a degree six multiplication gate. Therefore, I need to send degree six univariate polynomials during some check. Um, so there is some e exploration to be done there, but yeah. Mm -mm. Oh, 
Hold on. Uh, with this uh, structure, can you cover uh, Turing complete uh, operations or just like uh, these uh, like multiplications and additions? Ah, okay. So I think canonic GKR is. Ooh, Yorgos is gonna wreck me for this. Let's talk about this offline. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah. The one thing I will say is that uh, actually these structured or regular circuits cover a surprising number of operations. As in, for the circuit that we have for decision trees only a very, very small component of it cannot be written as a regular circuit. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. 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 Hi, thanks. Uh, great presentation. So any benchmark or result uh, can you share about G GKR, like a cost of intelligence follow-up? <laughs> Yeah, so the benchmarks you see in cost of intelligence are written in possibly the world's messiest, least commented code base ever. It was an academic code base um, from the folks who authored the ZKCNN paper, um, which we basically played with, made non-interactive, whatever. Um, for us, we are coming out with benchmarks soon, uh, but we've been working on basically uh, actually getting the code base out, getting the circuits out. Um, so I think with the open source, uh, we'll be able to offer some benchmarks. We do have a bit of time if anyone else has a question. Otherwise, yeah, okay. Nope. okay. I'll be back to you. You already got one. <laughs> yeah, so where were the testimonials? Ah, on, uh. <laughs> oh, I put these slides together last night and I didn't have time to ping them to see if I could get actual quotes. So I assume both of them have said this in our meetings at some point. <laughs> okay, good enough. I have more. Sorry. Sorry. You, you, uh, I mean that you can share, share it on, on the public chain that is on Ethereum. So share, share a slide on, on, on Ethereum or IPFS. Uh, oh, wait. Sorry. Could you repeat that? Could um, I, I mean that you can share your slide on IPFS. Oh, um, oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know how to do this distribution, but I, I will share the slides in whatever form factor is. Yeah. More like high level question, like where do you see ZKML going in terms of use cases? Uh, yeah. yeah, this is a really good question. So for us, I guess looking at basically inference, since training is a strict superset of inference and also not super clear what the value prop of training is, um, I think for us it looks like basically saying, hey, which projects, I guess in the crypto space, um, really like would be, would benefit like tremendously from machine learning models, like whether it's decision trees, whether it's neural networks, SVMs, whatever you want. And basically for these, I guess, like services, um, I guess how much of a value add is it such that like the cost of ZK, right? Because ZK is, you know, we all know this, like it, it costs more to prove than to not prove. So you need to, I guess, like pay extra in some sense. Um, but it's like, where, where does that make sense? So for us, actually one thing that we're coming out with very, very soon is basically a verifiable NFT project. So we're doing this in collaboration with Polymon Monsters, or Polychain Monsters. Um, and the idea there is that for NFTs, normally you have basically ownership provenance, right, because of the chain, but you don't have data source provenance. In other words, the first person who basically put that thing on chain, you don't know where they got it from, you don't know who uh, authored it, uh, it could be any number of things. And so in this case, once you have a ZKML proof that a generative art model actually created the image in the NFT, you now have complete picture provenance. You know everywhere it's been and also the exact model it came from, and that model itself could be like an NFT or something like that. So an on-chain AI artist, in other words. But do you see use cases outside of, let's say, blockchain space? Ah, use cases outside of blockchain space. I mean, the example that I always like to give, it's very far out in the future, but I guess the way that we like to think about it is basically, right, ZKML is like the, I guess, the marriage of two things. It's like machine learning and ZK. So machine learning, obviously, is really, really good for when you can't code an explicit algorithm to solve a problem, right? Like the best you can do is just gather a lot of data and then basically try and train a system, which you know, may or may not be explainable, probably isn't explainable if it's working very well, um, to basically solve that problem for you. Um, on the other hand, ZK basically gives you, uh, I guess, like output provenance, right? It tells you that this output definitely came from this model that you care about. So where I, I guess where we see that 
maybe most obviously is what I like to call like the language model judge example, which is where currently in a court of law, you can see the judge, you can see them, you know where they came from, you know all the cases that they've done before, you basically understand their experience, and so when they tell you their sentence, like you can't really refute it in some sense, right? Uh, in the future, on the other hand, if, for example, a language model became a judge, that is something that we really, really want to basically prove via ZKML. You want to make sure that the language model is fair, you want to make sure that it's unbiased, you want to make sure that it's robust, you want to make sure that it's the same language model which has been used for all the cases before you, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and also I guess the point is that the result there is very, very sort of like life-changing, as in it, they could sentence you to whatever. Um, and so in that case, it's very important that we know where the output of the model comes from, like which model it comes from. Yeah, so that's kind of the, I guess, like the high level like framework that we like to think about this. Cheers, thanks. To answer your question, the, the talks are recorded, so you can kind of get the slides through the video, I guess. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for your questions. Thank you so much. And yeah, now it's time for a break.